Good evening and welcome to Tuesday's edition of Live at Grange. This evening we have a panel of experts that are going to look at the whole area of the new dairy calf, the beef index, choosing a system of beef production that will suit your farm and looking at the areas of profitability in dairy calf to beef indexes. So come join us in our studio. Good evening and welcome to Live at Grange. Today, as part of the Chagask Virtual Beef Week, which is kindly sponsored by FBD Trust, we're focusing on all things dairy calf to beef production. Throughout today, we've had a huge amount of material that has been put up on social media, and we started off this morning with our beef talk, where we focused on what is happening here in Grange on the dairy calf to beef unit, including the animal health program, and we also looked at the Chagas uh, Green Acres dairy calf to beef program. Uh, this session is a live session, and what that means is that you, the viewer at home, can get involved in the discussion with our panel here this evening. You can do that in two different ways by texting in. You can text in and you'll see the details of this at the bottom of your screen to our text 51444 uh, and just follow the details on screen for that. Or you can, follow, you can follow us on Twitter and text in there through using the hashtag Virtual Beef Week. So first of all, I'm just going to introduce who our panel are here to start off the evening. We have Dr. Siobhan Ring. Siobhan is a geneticist with ICBF. We have Dr. Nikki Byrne. Nikki is working as a researcher here on the calf to beef unit, among other things, in, in Chagas Grange. And we've Sean Cummins, and Sean is on our Green Acres calf to beef program. So um, we're, go we're going to move on then and look at really our first topic of the evening really is going to look at some of the dairy breeding and some about beef systems. But first of all, we're going to take a, a trip down to Ballymacarby in County Waterford, where Richard Long, who is one of our Chagas Green Acres farmers, uh, is working uh, on a dairy calf to beef farm and purchased his, his calves from his brothers, Liam and Michael. Uh, they're really looking in the last number of years, in the last year or so, at this new dairy beef index and how they can use that dairy beef index to improve the quality of the calves that are coming from their herd. So let's take a trip down to Ballamacarby now and let's see how the Long brothers are using the dairy beef index. We are Richard and Liam Long. I'm on the Chagas Green Acres Calf to Beef program. Liam, my brother, is a dairy farmer, and all the calves that I'm rearing for the program all come from their farm. I'm farming here in Knock On with my wife Eileen and my two daughters Anna and Lucy. We're running a calf to beef system, buying all the calves for hundreds, between 100 and 120 of them, all coming from my brother's dairy farm in Ardfinnan. We're running them through to killing them in the factory at between 20 and 24 months of age, depending on whether they're steers or heifers. Last year, the average grade was O and O minus, and the kill out was 243 for the heifers and 268 for the bullocks. We're hoping that they bring up the grade one score, and if hopefully that we can increase the carcass weight by 20 kgs which would equate to, if Everton works out, in or around increase of 140 euros a hectare. We're pretty much doing the same thing, a little bit better management and just better genetics in the calves we're buying. So hopefully it'll work. Up until this year, we were buying Hereford and Angus. This year then, we looked through bulls between myself and my two brothers, and we have a mixture of Angus, Hereford, Belgian Blue, Charlie, Limousine and All Black. Well, from my point of view, I was looking at confirmation and carcass weight. From the lads' point of view, they were looking into gestation, into the bulls and easy calfing. So with the help of the DBI and I suppose a bit of to and fro, and we met in the middle and these are what we've selected from. Well, at home here on the dairy farm, we, we were finishing some of the cattle ourselves. So we, knew that we needed to improve the genetics and the carcass weights that we were finishing the cattle at. So when Sean and Alan Dillon came to Richard about uh, improving the breeding, we were all we were very enthusiastic about it. So all help was appreciated. And uh, last year we sat down with Rose Goulding and Joe Tobin from Munster AI and Sean and our own dairy advisor, Kevin Barron. And we came up with a team of bulls to try out. And uh, they're on the ground now this year, and that's what Richard has his calves. 
so all the first calfers were giving them all bracks just for short gestation and easy calfing. And the second calfers then are getting Herefords and the bigger ones are getting uh, Limousine as well. And then the older cows are getting Charlies and Belgian Blues. We were very happy with the calving ease of all, all the bulls. We had no issues. It seemed to work well and we've used the same approach again now for the breeding season of 2020. Well, the relationship with the long tier is ideal. Uh, you have no negative impact for the dairy farmer on the, the milk production traits, whereas the dairy far the beef farmer is getting a superior quality animal. Uh, relationships like this are important. It's a guaranteed route to market for the dairy farmer, and the beef farmer is getting a superior animal and hopefully a better return to market. Okay, so that's very interesting what we see there that the bro Long Brothers are doing using the New Dairy Beef Index uh, to select their calves. So first of all, I'm gonna to turn to Dr. Siobhan Ring from ICBF. Uh, Siobhan, you're a geneticist, is that, is that right, with ICBF? Yep, that's yeah. right, yep. You're very welcome uh, to Live at Range, uh, Siobhan. Thanks, Steve. Uh, first of all, I suppose a really easy one is how long is the Dairy Beef Index uh, out? Is it something that's been around a long time or is it new enough? No, so it's very new. So it's really only la uh, launched since last year and initially it was only there for um, AI bulls. So this year, I suppose it's even newer again in that it's uh, released for stock bulls as well. Um, and it's developed, I suppose, a big collaboration between ICBF, Chagask and Abacus Bio. Okay, so Richard and, uh, and Liam, they were explaining that they use the Dairy Beef Index. Can you explain to, to me and the viewers this evening, what is the Dairy Beef Index or DBI as some people call it? Okay, so um, it's a tool for the dairy and beef farmers um, to help promote quality beef from, from the dairy herd. And I suppose its aim is um, to give the dairy farmer what he wants in terms of easy calving and short gestation, and also give the beef farmer what they want in terms of um, increased carcass weight, better conformation, um, and things like that. Okay, so uh, wh wh what's its makeup, I suppose? What are, the, what are the traits that go into the, the dairy beef index, Siobhan? So I suppose there's a 50-50 split between um, traits that are important to the dairy farmer and traits that are important to the beef farmer. So on the dairy side of the house, we have um, gestation lint, so uh, we're looking for short gestation lint, easy calving and less calf mortality. When it comes to the beef, beef side of the house, we're looking at higher carcass weight, uh, more carcasses that will obviously come into um, specifications that will meet the factory spec for carcass weight um, and conformation. And then we're looking at animals that will um, require less feed essentially um, to finish. And of course, animals that are docile, things like that. Okay, so if I'm a beef farmer, what are the traits in the dairy beef index that will be of most interest to me? I'd imagine gestation lint is not of huge interest. Yeah, that's right. So what we've actually done is, like I said, we, we have, we have um, split the dairy beef up into, I suppose, two individual sub-indexes and a very quick guide that you could look at as, as a beef farmer, if you were looking at, at um, we'll say, the sire of the calves that, that you're purchasing, is you could look at the value of beef sub-index. So that's um, a euro value, and the higher the euro value, um, the more profit uh, expected from those progeny. Um, so I suppose, and the key traits again that are in there are your carcass weight, your conformation, fat feed intake, things like that. So the higher the better on all the of the higher, traits? The, the higher the euro value, the better. Um, the higher the carcass weight, the, more, the heavier the animal will be. The higher the conformation, the, the higher the grade um, the animal should be as well. And, and are we seeing much differences in the, in, the, in, the, in the bulls that are happening? Say, take for argument, say carcass weights. What kind of range are we seeing there between bulls? Yeah, so I suppose if you took, um, just for example, I suppose the active bull list and you took, uh, I suppose, bulls that um, have some progeny on the ground with the top bulls and that, I suppose the, the average of those bulls is about um, a 10 kilo uh, PTA value. But I suppose that range is from minus eight up to 40 kilo. So you've got a huge range in there and you've got a huge range um, in breeds as well. I think there's about 12 breeds on the list. So I suppose there's, there's no um, shortage of options to try. And is there high bulls in every breed? Uh, there would be, absolutely, yeah. There's as much variation um, with, within a breed as there is um, across a breed. So it's, I suppose it's, some people would be very focused on individual breeds, but I suppose, and maybe labelling one breed to be very good or very bad, but I suppose it's very important to look within the breeds to see what, what 
what that animal is good for. Okay, so, that, so that's it from a, from a beef farmer point of view. Dairy farmers are very much tuned into using the EBI or the Economic Breeding Index and you know, they've very successfully used that over the last number of years. Uh, and you know, the, the national dairy herd, to be fair, has significantly improved on things like fertility and that. Why would they, why would they use the Dairy Beef Index? Or you know, if we were trying to convince a dairy farmer to use the Dairy Beef Index, why would he bother, Siobhan? Yeah, okay, so first up, I suppose the EBI is for um, breeding dairy replacements for the dairy herd. The Dairy Beef Index is for breeding um, beef cattle from the dairy herd. So two very important um, distinguishing uh, features there. And I suppose why, why you would use that is I suppose traditionally, I suppose dairy farmers have been focused on the easy calving and short gestation as in getting out what they are looking for and they're focused on that. But I suppose you need to think of the bigger picture and I suppose of where those animals are going to go and you need to be sure of are you going to have a market for your calves. I suppose dairy herds are expanding and I suppose when you select on one or two traits, so for example, your calving and gestation, and if you only focus on those, there is the potential that the carcass quality of those animals will deteriorate, therefore making the, the beef farmer that's actually going to finish those animals, or whether even if the dairy farmer is themselves finishing them, those animals uh, may potentially just decline in carcass quality. So I suppose what we've done in the dairy beef index is combined all the traits that are important for the, for the future of the dairy beef system um, to, I suppose, rank bulls, I suppose, that, that should be promoted um, within that system. And I suppose there is a monetary a benefit um, from using the dairy beef index as well, be that from the dairy farmer side of the house or also um, on the beef side of the house as well. Um, and I suppose one thing that really comes to light this year and last year is if you think of actually calf price, farmers actually being able to um, get, get calves sold um, off the ground and be, being able to get a bit of value um, for those calves. So I suppose if you're promoting um, better quality carcasses, you know, those animals, some, there will be demand for them. If you're not, you know, you could be left with those calves. Okay, so it's a win-win really for, yeah. for both the dairy farmer that's using the dairy beef index and for the, for the beef farmer who eventually buys those calves. Yeah. You mentioned earlier on that it's now available. It wasn't available to begin with on AI bulls, but it's now available on stock bulls. Is that right? Yeah, so it was just AI bulls in 2019 and in 2020 it's also available for stock bulls. Okay, yeah. and is there any difference between, the, if you're looking at the indexes for the DBI for a stock bull versus an AI bull, or is one as good as the other or is there anything you need to watch out yeah, for? Yeah, so I suppose if you um, take an AI bull that has a dairy beef index of 100 euro and a stock bull with a dairy beef index of 100 euro, theoretically you should end up um, with the same um, progeny, I suppose the, the value of those progeny. But where you do see the difference really, I suppose, is when it comes to the reliability um, of the data that's feeding into those animals. So often, I suppose, a stock bull, you know, he might only be used in one herd, he might have five or six progeny, um, whereas an AI bull could have um, maybe 2,000 progeny across 200 different herds. So obviously, I suppose, the number of records feeding into the ICDF database and essentially into our evaluation is a lot larger for that AI bull. So I suppose his figures you know, we're happier that they're going to stand up over time when those progeny are actually slaughtered. So I suppose that's where the reliability of the AI bulls would be higher than your stock bulls. Okay, great. Thanks, Siobhan. Uh, we're going to ask Siobhan a, a few questions from the public in a few minutes, but first of all, I'm going to turn. So if people want to text in, as I said, to either that text number or on Twitter, now is your opportunity to send in those questions on the Dairy Beef Index. Uh, but I'm going to turn to Nikki, Dr. Nikki Bourne from Chagas Grange. Uh, Nikki, you're involved with the Dairy Calf to Beef Unit uh, here in Grange as part of your research. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, and uh, that was covered very uh, quite a bit by uh, your colleague Donal earlier on today on Beef Talk. And we come back to, to that in a few minutes. Uh, Siobhan there was talking a lot about the dairy beef index and, and you know, how, how it will improve the calves that are coming from the dairy herd for the beef farmer. Is that likely to have an effect on the type of systems that we're going to see on beef farms going forward, Nicky? Yeah, I think it will. And I think we'll see many benefits uh, throughout the system coming from the implementation of, of the dairy beef index. And I suppose at first I can see that it will add more value to the output that, that farmers are producing. So really from increasing the emphasis on carcass conformation, which has been uh, you know, an issue with the national dairy beef herd uh, over the recent years. You know, as the national dairy herd or the proportion of the national kill that has been of dairy origin, we've seen a decline in carcass conformation in particular, as well as some carcass weight. So really I think the introduction of the dairy beef index can you know, somewhat help turn that tide and really improve the, the value of the carcasses that we are getting from the dairy herd. And as well as that, I think we'll see it, you know, 
shift the focus away from breed, as Siobhan was saying, and focus on individual bulls that offer that balance of trait to both dairy and beef farmer. And I think that's going to be really important, using the best individuals rather than breeds. Um, so I think, you know, it's, it's a hugely welcome development. Um, and we will, you know, I think we will remain to, to see, you know, our early mature uh, beef breeds used extensively on the, the dairy herd. Um, but I think we'll see better individuals from those breeds used. And that's something that we really need to, to achieve is really improve the conformation of those animals to ensure that their progeny achieve maximum carcass value and avail a full breed bonus and quality assurance payment as well as uh, performing very, very well on the grid. So I think it's a very welcome development. Um, will it, do you think, Nicky, it'll, will it influence the choice of sires that dairy farmers are using? I mean, at the moment, you know, there's a lot of, okay, apart from, from Holstein or Parisian or dairy breeds, there's a lot of uh, early maturing breeds. Will it, will it influence, this, uh, uh, will it push, the, I suppose, in terms of some of the other breeds in, into the use? Yeah, absolutely. And we can see, you know, from the, the, the top ranking bulls on it, that they are, you know, not your traditional breeds that we would have seen used. And I think that's a very positive yeah, we see it with the longs there. The Richard was talking we about the using longs using, you know, continental bulls on their herd to, you know, improve their carcass conformation and add more value. Um, and, but one of the things, I think farmers really need to define their system and then buy the animals to suit that system. So I think that's just one word of caution for farmers, you know, to either implement a continental late maturing system uh, rather than complicating or mixing an existing system on farm. And what, what just on that, just moving on to that system uh, question, you know, what influences what system a beef farmer uh, chooses for his farmer? What should influence his choice of system? Yeah, so I suppose what should influence it is you know, the resources that are available to that farmer. So be it land resources, labour resources, the time that you have available, and also the skill of your, your labour, and I suppose the type of work that you enjoy. You know, some farmers, you know, may have uh, very, very good calf rearing skills, and other farmers may not have time to be rearing calves artificially, so they may opt to buy in calves weaned. Um, and also, we, we, we have to look, as well as the labour, we have to look at the facilities available on the farm. You know, is there housing facilities there? And, and if they're not there, that'll, you know, probably mean that you need to go to an early maturing system where you try and avoid and, you know, fully utilise your shed space available on the farm. the second winter, maybe. Exactly. Um, but I suppose some of the common factors that we see across the most profitable systems uh, are the use of grazed grass. So we know that the systems that can utilize large quantities of grazed grass, probably in excess of 80% of the animal's total lifetime feed requirement coming from grazed grass, and those that can achieve an early age of slaughter from, from that type of system are the most profitable. And over the years, you know, we've probably seen that, you know, your heifer systems killing at 19, 20 months, avoiding that second winter and carrying more animals per hectare, those systems have performed very, very favorably because they're able to produce high carcass output from a predominantly grass-based diet. And also, I suppose, uh, there's a lot of other factors that will promote and help uh, the implementation of dairy beef systems and their market and consumer factors. And we can see that dairy beef, you know, is a really good opportunity to produce a carcass on spec, you know, 280 to 320 kilos, which is very much in demand. A lot of the breeds that are used heavily on the dairy herd, you know, we know that there is, uh, you know, that they are market, uh, marketed and targeted towards high value specialist markets. Um, so, and we can also achieve, you know, the desirable uh, fatness on the carcass quite easily. And, the, you know, we probably do have, a, you know, very suitable animal for a, a pasture-based uh, beef production system. Yeah. Just on that, Nicky, what level is the performance? You're, you're, you've already slaughtered the first cattle from your dairy calf to beef trial here in Grange. What levels of performance are ye achieving uh, over those first and second summers at grass? Yeah, so from the dairy beef uh, study in Grange, we've one complete cycle of cattle killed. So some of those were, uh, you know, high EBI Holstein Frisian animals, and we had two different uh, Angus genotype groups. And, you know, it was a very intensive grass-based system. To the Holstein Frisians, we only fed 740 kilograms of concentrate in their entire lifetime, from birth right through to slaughter, and we're 100 kilos behind that for our early maturing Angus uh, animals. So we achieved 
uh, a 23 month age of slaughter for our Holstein Friesian and 22 months for our okay. early maturing Angus. So, you know, those anim animals to achieve those early age of slaughter, they obviously achieve yeah. high levels of performance over the, those over grazing those seasons. Grazing periods. So we need to be hitting, you know, about 0.8 of a day during the first grazing season. We need to be still growing the animal over the winter period, you know, from uh, a high quality grass silage diet achieving, you know, probably a 0.7 of, of a day we achieved. And then over the second grazing season, this is really where you, you need to economize and, and probably where we see us making our biggest gains and we're achieving 0.9 to a kilo a day on those animals. Okay. And because of that high grassland performance that we achieved and performance at grass, we saw that we only need to feed our animals for 60 days on an intensive uh, concentrate diet indoors for our Aberdeen Angus and 80 days for our Holstein Friesian. You mentioned high genetic and low genetic merit groups there, so th that was on, on, the, on the carcass indexes and things like that. Did you see a difference between the high index and the low index animals in that first group of animals that were killed? Yeah, absolutely. So I suppose what the difference that we saw between the two Angus groups, it was non-significant, the difference that we, we detected after one year's uh, gathering of data. However, you know, the, the experiment is only half powered at the moment and that will be completed with the second year's uh, slaughtering. And we saw that uh, we had a seven kilo difference between our high carcass merit Aberdeen Angus versus our low carcass merit Aberdeen Angus. But where we did see significant differences was in the value of each of those kilos, the confirmation of those carcasses that drove the value and the kill out percentage of those animals. And you know, so we achieved a higher value carcass from our higher next animal after the same finishing period and at the same age of slaughter. So really, and one of the things is that the genetic differences between the two Angus groups were quite small, and it's probably going to be much greater when we go back to the DBI and look at that wide array of breeds of bulls that we have, you know, that there's much bigger differences between them there. And, you know, I think on a bigger scale, you know, there, there is big gains to be achieved okay. uh, in carcass performance. And that trial is going to run for a number of years? Yeah, that trial is going to run for a number of years in its current format. And then from the learnings of it, we'll implement that and improve the system going forward. Okay, great. Okay, at this stage, we're going to move to a couple of questions that are coming in from the public. Um, and I've just taken one there for Siobhan, first of all, that has come in um, on the 51444. Um, Siobhan, it, it's, it's really about um, the DBI. Uh, is it overly favouring? Is it overly weighted towards dairy farmers? Uh, is basically the question. And is it, is it not you know, strong enough for beef farmers? Um, that's a good question. I suppose you really have to think about the whole system, right? So if you want to get a, a good dairy beef calf on the ground, you need somebody to produce that calf first of all. So if the dairy farmer is not going to use the index because the bulls are too difficult calving or too long of gestation, you must remember that they are in the business of producing milk. So if they can't get the cow back into the parlour without having those problems, they're not going to produce that, that high carcass weight um, animal for you. So I suppose the 50-50 split really, I'm not saying that won't change in the future, you know, as we add new traits and things like that. But initially, I suppose, as we um, get farmers, I suppose, to, to get a bit of confidence in using the index, I suppose it's, it's relatively new. And I suppose over a couple of years, we'll see farmers actually starting to, to gauge actually what even is the index and even just figuring out how to use it. And I suppose we may see changes after that. But really, we need to get people using it. And I suppose the... The, the, we need to produce the calf before we can actually, um, you know, help the beef farmer, I suppose, have that, those better okay. quality carcasses. Okay, another question for you, uh, Siobhan. Are dairy farmers overly cautious on calving ease, given how the long brothers can use surely on their cows? Oh. Um, I suppose that's... Um, it's not something we see too often on dairy farms now, surely, that's being right. used, but yeah. they seem to be, yeah. So I, sp I suppose they're really an, an exceptional case, really. I suppose they've, they've really shown us the benefit of the relationship between the dairy and the beef farmer and how I suppose that dairy farmer had never used Charlie's before but I suppose because the beef farmer was saying okay well I need a better quality carcass so unless you can you know unless you're actually going to give that to me maybe I'll move elsewhere so I suppose that in essence I suppose is where you're where getting the beef farmer the dairy farmer to work together conversation yeah you know you'll actually start to you know maybe maybe encourage some Charlie's into some herds but I suppose I wouldn't say dairy farmers are too overly cautious um, on calving difficulty. And I don't think, I suppose, that just because you use the dairy beef index, you're not going to end up with harder um, calving bulls. 
from that being from the dairy farmer's point of view. There are bulls on that list. If anybody wants to look at them, they're on ICDF.com. Um, basically, they're, they're easy calving, same as what farmers would have been using before, um, which they would have assumed said were easy calving, but also have those beef uh, char characteristics. So there's no reason to sacrifice the beef for the calving difficulty. Okay. I'm just going to take one more question, a quick one for you, Nikki, because you're going to stay with us for the rest of the panel and we can come back to you again. If you had a preference for a calf breed or you were setting up a, a calf to beef unit yourself in the morning, is there any particular preference you'd have for breed a calf or system? Yeah, so I suppose one of my own preferences, just because of you know the volatility in beef price at the moment that we see and maybe at the low level that it has been at over the last 12 months, I'd be really focusing on probably the best value calf that I can get a healthy calf um, and a calf that is going to perform and grow. So I, I want a calf that's priced closest to its genetic potential to deliver, deliver a carcass performance. And from our own experience here on the study in Grange, we've probably seen that it has been the Holstein Friesian that has delivered that because the lower calf purchase price has allowed us to achieve the highest margin uh, per head or per hectare from that type of a system. So at the moment, um, I, I'd probably be buying uh, Holstein Friesian uh, bull calves um, uh, and at a very, very competitive price. That's okay. what I'd be focusing on. Okay, that's very interesting. Okay, thank you, Nikki, and thank you, Shishwan, for, for answering those questions. So at this stage, we're going to move to a new topic, and we're going to move to looking at the Chagas Green Acres Dairy Calf to Brief Program and some of the lessons that are coming from it. The, the program is a joint initiative run by Chagas in, uh, with, with our industry partners, and those industry partners are Liffey Mills, Drummonds, uh, Cortiva AgriScience, Folak, um, uh, uh, Munster, uh, Munster uh, Bovine, um, and, um, uh, um, and uh, Argyland are partners in the program. Um, but first of all, what we're going to do is we're going to take a trip to see one of the farmers who were in the program, uh, Martin Connolly. He's uh, down in County Roscommon, um, and Martin uh, has done a number of changes on his farm over the last uh, 12 months. And we want to really see what has Martin done on his farm to, ch to, to see in the last 12 months his improvements. So we'll head to Ross Commons to see that now. I'm Martin Connolly and I'm farming here in Castle Plunkett, County Ross Common. I usually buy about 120 freezing bull calves and finish them as bull beef, generally around 22 months of age. I'm lucky, I suppose, that I can buy off maybe three or four local dairy farmers. I've been dealing with them for a good number of years. And I'm lucky also that I get good healthy stock off them. Um, they're well looked after from birth. And uh, that's, it's always a great start to get good healthy calves coming in. The other thing too, buying local, um, they happen to travel too far. So they're coming here, they're only 10 or 15 minutes away from their farm of origin when they land here. So they're always in good form when they come in and uh, that's a great start. Once the calves arrive in here on the farm, we get them into their pen. We make sure that they're that plenty of bedding, fresh, clean water. We give them a couple of days in to settle in and we start them on their vaccination program. This is the first year maybe that we have maybe followed through with the vaccination program 100%. Their first shot for pneumonia, they get their intranasal IBR, and then later on they're getting their shots for clostridial disease. Norsen there from vaccinating this year, it has absolutely changed our dependence on antibiotics. After the calves are weaned and thinking of letting them out, we'd hope to have them on two to three kilos of meal a day. We'd usually maybe keep them close to the house for maybe a couple of weeks after letting them out. We'd keep the meal to them just to get them climatized to the, the outdoors and give them a, a gradual change over. Then we'd be aiming to have fresh grass. Now this year we're lucky enough to have after grass pretty early there maybe three weeks ago. And uh, we've been moving the stronger calves on that every three or four days, moving them from paddock to paddock. We've continued feeding maybe a kilo and a half a meal a day. The lighter calves then, we'd probably keep a kilo a meal to them for the summer, uh, just to keep them going. The system that I'm running here, one of the key elements would be to have good quality silage, the best possible. The last couple of years, I would have slipped a little bit and I uh, paid the price in terms of me feed and meal. This, this year we concentrated on having an early cut so we grazed late into the back end with some of the lighter wainlands and uh, we got slurry out in January 
and we got a fertilizer, we got 100 units of nitrogen out uh, towards the end of March. So uh, we harvested that on the 11th of May. So uh, we got a very good quality cut of silage in, in good weather. Uh, following that, we um, came back with uh, another 2,500 gallons of slurry and 70 to 80 units of nitrogen. We're ready to harvest that now. The first chance or the first chance we get in the weather, we, we'll be ready to take that cut. And uh, if we can, we will have very good silage in for this winter. The silage quality, I think we, we have enough of silage in now. Definitely if we get this second cut in, um, we should have plenty to get it over the winter because we had surplus silage bales as well from paddocks uh, throughout the grazing season. I'd be quite happy that we would have plenty of silage stock in, in store for this winter. It should mean an awful lot of saving as far as meal feeding to the bull, finishing bulls, and also to the, the wanelands uh, over the winter. Okay, that's very interesting there to see what Martin is doing uh, as part of the Calf to Beef program down in Roscommon. I'm now joined in the program by Aidan Maguire. Aidan is also one of our Calf to Beef program farmers, and Aidan's not far from here in Chagas Grange. He's over in, in Navin. You're very welcome to Live at Grange, Aidan. Thanks, Piers. Well, first of all, I'm going to move to Sean. Sean Cummins is our program advisor on the, pro on the program. Uh, Sean, you're very welcome to Live at Grange. Uh, Sean, we saw there uh, with Martin Connolly that there was a, a number of things that he's done in the last 12 months. Uh, one of the big things he talked about was the whole area of reducing the level of antibiotics that he's using on his farm. Um, he seems to have done a lot uh, to improve that um, and uh, he seems to have uh, brought in a number of different measures. Is that something that you're seeing on other Green Acres farms? Is it something that you're working on them? Uh, we know antibiotic resistance is something that we're all worried about in the industry. It's something that we're all going to have to focus on a huge amount more over the next 10, 20, 30 years for the rest of our, our careers. Uh, is that something that ye as program advisors are working on uh, with the program, program farmers, including the likes of Martin and Aidan here this evening? I suppose, Piers, probably what we really need to aim at is keeping the animal healthy. And if we're able to keep an animal healthy, we're going to automatically reduce our antibiotic usage. So we can often complicate the message in terms of antimicrobial resistance and what antibiotics are being used. But once we get that animal healthy, it's, it's really key to the program. I suppose we're very, very lucky in terms of the animal health programs are, we're working up for farmers and that we've involvement from one of our stakeholders, MSD. And that's, that's a huge help in, in terms of implementing some of, the, I, implementing some of the measures at farm level. So I suppose what we're trying to do with the farmers and what thankfully they are doing for us is they're actually focusing on where they're buying the calf. So on the first day, they're buying a healthy calf. Um, we've seen farmers move, move, move more to buying calves directly off dairy farms. Um, previously, we'd seen farms that were buying calves through marts or through dealers, and some of the calves, in terms of the health status coming in, would have been suspect, and that did cause problems. Um, but once you have once you have a healthy calf, the next thing you really have to look at is where you're going to put that calf on your farm. So we brought the farmers together, I think it was last o late October, November last year, and just looked at the elements of calf housing. So we looked at ventilation, preventing drafts, even something as simple as where you're mixing the milk replacer on your farm, just to give that environment, that, that calf the perfect environment to perform. So once you have a healthy calf going into a perfect environment, the next thing then is prevention. So all the farmers have been recommended a vaccination program. So we're basically looking at trying to treat our pneumonia or trying to prevent outbreaks of pneumonias and IBR. Um, possibly, or the, the main ones we're trying to hit there is our PR3 or, or RSV and our IBR. We're also implementing procedures there for clostridial diseases at farm level. Uh, probably a big thing as well at farms that we're seeing is that the nutrition or the nutrition that's going into calves this year have improved significantly, I would say. Um, you probably often heard that a, a, a full calf is a happy calf, but if a calf gets hungry or it's not been fed the quality milk replacer that it needs, or it's been fed, underfed, the calf is stressed, and the stressed calf is very, very close to being a sick calf. Pierce. Okay, so just go back there on, on, the, on the vaccination. You were saying, you know, at what stage are you going in with those vaccination programs? Uh, is, it, is it very early in the life, or is it later, or when is it? Generally, generally, and it's the advice we've been getting from the, well, the farmers have been getting from their own local vets and through input as well, is that um, we're looking at letting the calf rest the day before we go in with the first shot of vaccine, just to make sure that we actually get the bang for the buck. So they'd only just have been bought, and you'd be talking about going in there with the no, vaccine? No, the next day. The yeah, next but day. Yeah, I mean, you yeah, a day give, or two within a purchase. Give the, give the calf a chance to settle, get accustomed to its new environment. 
then that's, that's for the first shot IBR and our pneumonia. We'd be following that up then roughly three weeks, four weeks later with a booster shot for pneumonia as well. But it, it, it all depends on what the veterinary advice is in that regard. Um, we'd be looking at going in with our IBR then, um, the calf roughly at 12 weeks of age. And then again for pneumonia, um, when the calf is seven to eight months of age or possibly the next stress period, which in calf to bee systems tends to be just when the calf has been housed or prior to the calf being housed. Okay. And what impact are you seeing across the farms? I mean, you're involved in a number of the farms. We've seen, last year on the farms, we've seen across the 12 farms we're working with, the mortality rates on the farms coming in around 5%. That's higher than what we needed to be. And I suppose there was a number of issues with calves coming in that issues with pneumonia to develop and issues with scours to develop. Thankfully, this year, we've seen it reduce significantly. And that's basically through the measures that have been outlined. Okay, Nikki, just on that, I mean, you buy a lot of calves here as well. Uh, what level of mortality rate are you seeing coming on this? Yeah, so we're mixing maybe 35 to 40 different sources. And over the last two years, we achieved mortality rates of 1.4 and just under 1% this year. Uh, respect and how's your, what's your vaccine? Is it, is it similar? So our vaccination it? protocol is very, very similar to that that, that Sean outlined. Uh, our calves are arriving at three weeks of age. Uh, we're settling them in for 24 hours before we go in with our vaccinations intranasally for RSV, uh, PI3 and IBR and then follow up boosters a month after. And like Sean said, before any of those stress points, uh, you know, six months on, such as housing or castration, we'd like to go in and give our booster shots in advance of that to, to get the animal over that stress period. Okay, great. Another thing that Martin was talking about in the video there, Sean, was improving his silage quality. Um, you know, we, we all know that silage quality, making good quality silage is really important for calf to beef farms because, you know, they, they're not, they don't have a dry period, they don't have a period that they can put on no weight gain, you're really. But, but what are you seeing on the program again, similar to Martin, you know, what, what are the issues that's holding back quality silage being made or what are the things that are being Im implemented probably more positively on the farms that are improving the quality of silage that's being made on those farms? I suppose Pierce last year when it came to just monitoring the weights of the cattle we were seeing that cattle just weren't coming out of the shed at the weight they needed to be on, on many of the farms in the programme and I suppose that came down to really the sil silage quality that was going in. Um, so we, we, we discussed it with farmers earlier in the year that we need to try and bring up the quality of the silage that we're seeing at farm level. So we're aiming for a silage quality between 76 or 74 and 76 DMD. I suppose the question why we were aiming so high, but like last year our average silage quality of 69.5 for the farms in the programme for the first cuts. If we were able to get the silage quality up to where we want it to be this year, we're going to see the meal feeding levels reduced on farm by about 750 grams a day. 750 grams a day mightn't seem like a lot, Piers, but if you put that over a 120 day winter, it's 21 euro a head for an animal. Or okay. In region, so that, like if you're stocked to two livestock units, that's 40 euro straight off your net margin straight away. Um, we, what we tried to do with the farmers is we said, look, we'll try and get the silage closed. Well, get the silage closed by the latest to St. Patrick's Day, the 17th of March. Um, from that then, we either had to work out how we were going to get it grazed off before or grazed in the back end of the year to, to make sure that the, but or the, the new crop that was going was actually going to be of quality. So in some cases, farmers grazed lighter stock late into the back in, end of the year and in others, uh, the grazed that, the, that had the silage ground grazed before it was actually let out. We looked at then what fertilizer was needed. So on some of the farms in the programme, there, there is issues with soil fertility levels. So we're seeing that her P and K levels are probably about 40 and 50% of where they need to be. Like only 40 and 50% of the soils are at index three and four. So we then looked at going in and putting in the right type of fertilizer. And um, basically we were looking at going in with 100 units of nitrogen and then topping up our P's and K's where required with either a slurry or compound fertilizers. We gave the farmers the deadline of having their first cuts done by the 20th of May, and thankfully it was nearly achieved in all cases, bar the odd paddock that was grazed later in or any small fields in some cases. Um, what we have seen as well is that the second cuts on the farms, in Martin's video there, he was actually walking through a field of silage. That has actually been cut close on two weeks this year, and many of the farmers in the programme have their second cuts com completed already. So what we're trying to do is instead of getting the big bulk of first cut, we're trying to go in and get two quality cuts that we can reduce our meal feeding levels. Just back to Martin there as well, like Martin's first cut was cut towards the end of June last year, so he nearly has the two cuts done at this stage. That's great. Yeah. Okay, thanks Sean, I'll come back to you in a minute. Aidan, you're very welcome, as I said, to live at Grange. Uh, maybe give a bit of a background to where you're from, uh, what your farming system is, 
uh, and uh, and what basically what your farming system is, I suppose, Aidan, right. where you're farmed. Yeah. Well, I'm farming at Navin, County Mead. I'm farming about 46 hectares of all grassland. Um, I rear calves, that's what I do, 120 heifer and bull calves, bite them in three weeks of age sort of thing, and rear them on, uh, aim to have them killed around, the heifers around the 20 month age and the bullocks 24 months out of the shed. Okay, and, yeah. and, and you're in the Green Acres programme, Aidan. Yeah. What changes have you made in the last, we hear from Martin there saying he's done quite a number of changes. Um, has your system changed? Have you ch made other changes to the farm since you joined the programme? Well, the biggest change I made was probably dividing the place up into better paddocks and then the housing facilities, the, sh uh, the, calving, the sheds for rearing the calves have been upgraded definitely. Uh, the feeding space is allocated for fattening cattle, like you now feed meal. Okay. In, the, in the pens and that so and were you not fini fi fi finishing cattle up i wasn't up until that i really wasn't uh, i was selling stores okay. you know calf to store selling them at 450 kilos but there was through the program and that i realized that there is more to be taken from an animal okay. by finishing it and, and would you say the paddocks made the biggest improvement or the sheds made the biggest improvement or wh where would you in your opinion think you know uh, has made the biggest improvement uh, in terms of performance, yeah. the impact on performance on cattle that you're now able to finish them at younger yeah. ages. I think the biggest single improvement was probably the grassland management. You know, getting them out early, keeping them a long time at grass has, you know, has improved the weight going into the shed. Okay. Um, you know, they've done so Great. well. And what number of calves are you buying every year? Aidan? I uh, buy in about 120, split between autumn and springborn. Okay, and yeah. you rear all them yourself? Everything, yes, okay. yeah. And where are they coming from? Aidan? They're coming from three local farmers, more or less three local farmers, uh, which they know what I want, and uh, I can, you know, I can I get a phone call to say they're ready, and yeah. I go and collect. And breeds? Angus, Frisian, and Hereford. And would you have any any personal choice one I'm, over the I'm other? A bit like Nicky there, I do prefer me Frisian. The Frisian okay, seems to go ahead better, has better growing possibilities, and okay. that you know, and it, you end up with more carcass sold at the end of the day. You yeah. know, compared to an Angus, an Angus is a grand little creature, but it uh, just doesn't have the weight. Yeah. You know, for for its age, shall okay. we say? Yeah. Okay, and you're buying, you say, from three farms. Yeah. Um, do you know, do you buy calves from the mart at all? I have bought calves from the mart and ended up in a bit of bother with them. Um, they seem to have come with every condition that was uh, possible for them to have, and it was a struggle to get them through. I got them all through, thank God, and uh, they turned into nice weanlings now, but it was an awful lot of extra work. Okay. Yeah. Just on that, Sean, is that unusual in the programme, only buying from three? We hear Richard there is only buying from one. He's lucky it's his brother's. Uh, but you know, is that something we're seeing in the program, or or is there bigger numbers? We're after seeing sort of a change, Pierce, between the spring of nineteen and spring of twenty, um, where some farmers are buying calves from a large number of sources. They're actually after getting stung in a way with disease outbreaks, so they're going back to actually buying off dairy farms where they know the type of calf they're buying, they know what's happening on the farm. So that's that's helping in a way. Um, I suppose there is. There is still an element of calves being bought from marts and dealers, but they tend to be more the autumn calf, where just the numbers available on the market are very, very tight at that time of the year. Okay, okay, so it's not, not tightening up the numbers they're coming from. What kind of range would it be? Uh, ranges from one to about six. Um, in terms of the six at the minute, it's basically two splits, so two rearing, so it's three three farms for each okay. for each group of calves, if that makes sense. Okay. Very good. Okay, um, and um, what, what, when you're looking to buy a calf, Aidan, you know what? What is it you're looking for in a calf? Well, firstly, he must be three weeks old. That's the most for me. That's the most important thing, and uh, he has to be, say, shiny coat, bright eyes, uh, dry nose, dry navel, you know, and good and lively. Okay. All the signs that he's got plenty of colostrum. Okay. So. Okay. Yeah. And and. Um, is there any is there a situation where we heard earlier on about the dairy beef index so the situation where maybe if you could buy the continental calves that you would buy continental calves or are you more sold on buying the, the angus and the herefords and the frisians 
I would be more sold on the Angus and the Hereford and the Frisian. I'd say the Hereford and Frisian more, more so than the Angus, but uh, this, you know, it, those are the type of cattle that are calves that are being offered to me. Okay. The chances of getting a Charley from my dairy men is okay. very slim. Okay. Yeah. Sean, just coming back to you on the, on the Dairy Cafe Beef Programme, the Greenacres Programme, you know, what are the, some of the other lessons that we're seeing? You know, like what's impacting on profitability? What are the big things that are impacting on profitability on those farms? Basically, Pierce, it goes back to some of the points we've been touching on, but generally what we're seeing is actually the loss in performance in some cases on farms. Um, thankfully, the farmers in the programme, they're, they're after becoming very, very efficient grassland managers, and now they're in a position where they're taking out surplus bales and they're keeping the grass right in front of the cattle the whole way through the season. So, like, the, we're in a position where we could potentially be losing 0 0.2, 0 0.3 of a, a kilo a day in terms of live weight gain for for a year plus stock in a way because they're going in they're going in grazing covers of two and a half thousand three thousand just because the farmer was fearful they were, they were losing they were, they were going to run out of grass but thankfully this has changed because farmers are starting to believe in in the grass measure and what it can actually do um another thing that we've seen the farmers as well or since since the program i think is has been a help to the farmers is to have a clear direction of where they're going they know that if they buy a calf in the morning that 24 months down the line or 20 months down the line or 28 months down the line, that animal is going to going to hit such and such a carcass at whatever the beef price may be. But if we have budget in beef prices, so they have an idea what they're going to be selling down the line. Okay. Just on carcass weight, coming back to you, Nikki, that's an interesting point we, and we didn't get to talk about it. But what kind of carcass weights, uh, again, going back to those, that I know it's only the first bunch of animals that have been slaughtered in that, but they did, as you say, perform really well up to 22, 23 months before they were slaughtered. What kind of carcass weights were you getting on, across the different groups? Yeah, so to begin with our Holstein Frisian genotype, we achieved a carcass weight of 305 uh, kilos, and we finished 3.2 animals per hectare. So that generated a carcass output of 976 kilos carcass output per hectare. So that is very, very high level of carcass output. When we look at our high index uh, Angus, they achieved a carcass weight of 300 kilos, Great O equals, and they achieved a, a carcass output of 960 kilos uh, on, on a per hectare basis. And our lower index Angus, they were seven kilos lighter than those. Still, they were categorized as an O equals, and they achieved uh, 940 kilos carcass output per hectare, but it was probably of a slightly lower value than what our higher index animals were. Um, and also, when we go back to the Frisians, you know, at the three plus, we drafted them all at three plus, we'd maximise their carcass weight potential at that, and they graded O minus borderline P plus. So the real area for improvement in the Frisians would be on their carcass conformation, and if we can do that, they'd offer a lot more themselves, and they'd also influence the carcass conformation of the beef cross progeny coming from that cow type. And then I think we'd really see a lot more to offer. Uh, and, from and, and some people, and, and that's, that, that, that's at a kind of a 23 month of age, is it? But some people would argue, you know, would you not leave them there and, you know, they were slaughtered out of the shade very early? Could, would you not leave them there for another two, three months, put up another 20, 30 kilos or whatever that it might be over a period of time? What was your thinking on that? Yeah, so I suppose our system, we're limited by by land, that was our limiting factor in the equation. So we wanted to drive output per hectare. And we got, we're got we probably looking forward and looking towards the environment as well. You know, if we can reduce age of slaughter, that would probably have the single biggest effect on reducing our agricultural emissions um, uh, from an animal point of view. So really, we're making full use of grass and uh, maximizing our carrying capacity and driving the system from an output per hectare basis rather than output per individual animal um, or, or any other format. So really, it, that's the best option for our system and the type of animals that we've had. We would have been holding those animals back to let them go on. And we achieved national average carcass performance, but at six months younger than what has been achieved nationally. Okay, great. Thanks, Nikki. Okay, at this stage, we're going to take a small number again questions from the public. And again, there's still a time and opportunity for people there to text in questions. Um, first question in here is a nice simple one for you, uh, Sean. Are all the Green Acres farmers going to make money this year? Are they going to make a net profit? That's and, true. And, and I know the first, the, the, it's not in this question, but I know uh, from previous experience, it's don't talk about gross margin, talk about net margin or net profit. Yeah, so last year, Pierce, Pierce, we've seen that the net margin across the average 12 farms was 8 euro per hectare. 
which, being honest, isn't where we need it to be. We're trying to target a net margin for these farms of 500 euro per hectare. Um, I suppose we're in a position where livestock performance is going to increase. We're going to see output starting to, to climb this year as well. And we're going to see heavier carcass being produced at farm level. We've also had a relatively good year, except for maybe a, a shadow in the country or a corner in the country that were hit with drought in a way. But we've, we've worked it in a way that, that the cost that went in to try and resolve this were very, very small. It was surplus, surplus bales that were taken earlier in the year that went in to resolve that. Um, we are going to see the farmer's net profit improve this year. The degree to which that happens depends on what way beef prices stay for the rest of the year. Okay. I suppose we can't let you off then, Nicky. You know, you, you've had a, a full cycle of the programme. Did Grange make money last year on the, on the, on the calves that were slaughtered at those weights and ages? Yeah, so I suppose we, we did make some money. However, I don't think it really reflected the, the performance of the system. And I think what really hampered us was calf purchase price. 2018 was probably a very expensive calf. Uh, for our Angus, as we saw it there, they added a euro to our cost of production, their, their calf uh, purchase price. And obviously, beef price was very, very low. So that's why we saw our Holstein freezers achieve the highest level of profitability, um, where they generated a net margin of 256 euro. Uh, we saw them with our high index Angus, that they generated a net margin of around 64 euro per hectare. And our lower index Angus, you could say that they broke even, they only generated a net margin of 3 euro per hectare. So just on that then, what if I was if I if I was a hundred percent sure I had a high index Angus calf in front of me and a low index calf in front of me, what should the difference I be paying in purchase price for those calves? Yeah, well look, it's 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 very hard to say, and it's very hard to tell at, at three weeks of age without that genetic information on an animal. It's very hard to tell what his his potential is. But your your what kind of range I, could I, I be looking at? The way I look at it is for your your early mature and beef calves, I wouldn't like to see any more than 40 to 50 cent added to your cost of production. And if he's a good quality calf, capable of delivering more carcass performance, you would obviously get more for the calf still at that 40 that's, to 50 That's 40 to 50 cent per kilo of carcass. Per, per kilo, yeah. Okay. So you can predict what carcass weight you think that animal will be from your set system. Yeah. And I think you can work back from that. But what we saw was 95 cents to a euro been added to some of our Angus calves. Um, and I think that's far, far too high. Okay, very good. Aidan, question in for you. Uh, why didn't you finish the cattle before you joined the programme is the question. Uh, good question. It was a, a numbers game I was at that time. I was literally piling the cattle through the system, trying to create an income. Okay. And that, that, so that was basically it. There was a lot of good cattle been sold out off the farm, but not finished. I was working very hard, and I wasn't really achieving a, a sufficient margin to be, okay. to be at it. Great, okay, thanks Aidan. Question uh, for, for you, Sean. Um, are the calves in the Green Acres program all genotyped at birth, and would that be a help for the future? No, they're not, Pierce, and it would it, it really, really eliminate the risk of buying in something that you didn't want to buy in, in terms of poor quality genetics or genetics that weren't going to work for the farmer system. Okay. Okay. Um, down the line, there is talks of calves being genotyped, but is it something they it, ne it, it needs it, it needs it needs like should the onus be on the beef farmer to pay for a genotype or should it be on the dairy farmer? Okay, so maybe who there's has a discussion between both that if, if if they could come to an agreement, is it something you'd be interested in, Aidan? If you if you knew you could genotype, would you would you look at sharing the cost with your dairy farmer and neighbours? Most definitely would. Yeah, yeah. Anything that increases the output from the animal for the input I'm putting in, like, yeah. it, I think it'd make a difference as a help. Okay. We're going to need buy-in though, Pierce, from the dairy industry for that to happen as well. Absolutely. Because it's going to identify the poor performing calves on dairy farms straight away. Okay. Nicky, mm. have you any comments on that? Yeah, so look, we um, identified our calves, the ICF identified the herds that they were, uh, the semen was used in after the bulls of interest. And, you know, we had a lot of information on the background and we still ended up with 11% incorrect parentage on those animals. So there is animals there that aren't who they're meant to be. Um, however, when you look at the three euro net margin per hectare from those low index Anguses, the cost of genotyping loaded on, on top of that, uh, you know, and it's too late at that stage to, to, um, 
to take any action. I think it's too late at that stage for the beef farmer to be getting that information. He's the cat bought. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to get more information on the cow herd, the bulls used on the herd, and on the calf in front of us at the time of purchase. So okay. we really need it at an early stage and have it available. You know, as soon as your BVD test is back, we'd need to be known that this calf is of uh, such genetic potential. Another question there for you, Aidan. Calf prices this spring, what you paid for calves this spring and what you paid last year, did you see a difference in the calf prices that you had to pay? I know you're dealing with the same three farmers. Yeah, I mean, I'm slightly dealing different than people in the market. I have paid less, slightly less this year as opposed to last year. Was yeah, the dairy farmers understood that. They're, we haven't been making a lot of money over okay. the last few years. Something had to give. So we did agree. I'm inclined to buy a flat rate that certain price for Angus, certain price for Hereford, and certain price for Frisian. The three farmers agree with my price, and I agree with theirs, and we take it from a good relationship. The, good relationship, yes, definitely. You know. Yeah, in the programme itself, Sean, would you have seen, you'd have done quite a bit of analysis, I know, on calf prices from last year to this year. Was How can you, how, what differences were you seeing? Yeah, um, basically, Pierce to Halstein, Frisian calves this year came in at around 64 euro a head. Last year, they came in at 90, so we did see a reduction. But in terms of where the beef price is, we didn't see a reduction. We didn't see a big enough reduction. And we've seen that Harangus calves cost nearly double that. And just looking at the performance that the farmers got last year in terms of the Harangus and the Whitehead cattle, it, it, it's, first, it's first year results. And their animals, or their, their scope to actually improve the carcass weights. But if we were to look at the value of an Angus calf and a Hereford calf in comparison to the Frisian, for the 12 farmers we're working with, the farmers would only be paying 40 euro more. In some cases, they're paying 110 euro more for the Angus and Hereford this year. Okay, okay. Uh, another question in here on ventilation, uh, and I'm going to show it to you, Nikki. You know, how important is ventilation in sheds and controlling drafts in a, in, in a calf to be system? Yeah, so it's everything, and we even see variation in some of the sheds that we have available to us here in Grange. You know, we've Yorkshire Borden uh, using natural uh, ventilation with the stack effect. Then we have some forced ventilation systems, and you see the they function differently depending on the weather conditions outside, you know, um, but ventilation, stopping densities in those sheds are crucial. We find when we start weaning calves and getting them out of the shed, any of our uh, problems nearly disappear. So we would see uh, some challenge, you know, when, time, when temperatures are fluctuating with a highly stocked shed, we, we do uh, incur and some problems. And there's anything you can do in the sheds to improve the ventilation apart from Yorkshire Borden? Yeah, so look, you, you need to you need to assess the ventilation in there, um, you know, make corrective actions, put in the appropriate ventilation. But the stock and density of the calves is one of the you know the obvious ones that you have full control over. Grouping the calves as well, maybe um, you know keeping uniform groups of calves from similar sources and not be mixing and remixing groups as you're uh, receiving intakes of calves throughout the throughout the season. Okay, great, Nikki. Thanks for that, and thanks to Aidan, and thanks uh, for Sean for, for all that. That's very interesting. Uh, really, at this stage, we're going to have to bring uh, this evening's Live at Grange uh, to a close, um, and just to thank our panel and to thank Siobhan from earlier on. So um, we, we really heard a lot today in our virtual beef week about the whole calf to beef area. We had a huge amount on social media, um, and we, we our, our beef talk this morning. Um, at this stage, I want to just thank a few people. First of all, I want to thank um, our, our panel this evening, Siobhan Ring from ICBF from earlier on, Aidan Maguire, I want to thank Nikki, uh, Nikki Bourne, and I want to thank Sean Cummins. Um, I also want to thank just the production team that was involved uh, here today in terms of putting all this together. So I particularly want to thank Declan McArdle uh, from Chagask and uh, Martin de Bourne from, um, from Agriland and all of, their, all of their colleagues that are working on the programme. I also just want to thank the organisers of the day. There's uh, different people that are organising the day in terms of the social media posts that are going up um, throughout the day. Uh, and the organisers of that are Nikki Byrne that's here with us, but also Alan Dillon on that. Tomorrow, the Chagas Virtual Beef Week is Wednesday, moving on to sustainable beef production. And what does that mean for the beef farmer, uh, and but also the, the wider industry? So again, no different than uh, the earlier today and yesterday, uh, we have quite a, a large number of social media posts and videos going out on the topic tomorrow on the whole area of sustainable beef. Uh, we have our beef talk in the morning at 12 midday, and we'll be once again here in Live at Grange tomorrow evening at 7 o'clock 
uh, for the panel discussion to talk about the whole area of sustainable beef production. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, you, the viewer, for viewing in, um, and we uh, wish you good night and goodbye from Grange. <laughs>